So water freezes at temperatures that are below zero degrees Celsius. How does the entropy of the water change when it freezes? It decreases, right? Because it becomes more ordered. There are fewer microstates to put the energy in. So the entropy of water decreases as it freezes. So how is that process spontaneous then? Well, second law of thermodynamics, let's fill in the blank. For any spontaneous process, the entropy of what? I completely screwed up. Okay, so we fixed our previous screw up. Now let's fill in the blank. For any spontaneous process, the entropy of blank increases. The universe. So when the water is freezing below zero degrees Celsius and its entropy is decreasing, does that mean it's not spontaneous? No. We know it is spontaneous. The process is spontaneous. It's, it's happening in your freezer at home, right? You put water in there, it's below zero degrees Celsius, the water freezes, it's spontaneous. Because the entropy of the universe is increasing, the entropy of that system is decreasing, but the entropy of the universe is increasing. So we have to distinguish between system and surroundings. So thinking about ice freezing below zero degrees Celsius, we consider the water as the system, and then the surroundings, the surroundings could be that part of the universe that is close to the ice, or it may have to be, be expanded to include the entire universe. We don't usually have to do that in chemistry. So the entropy of the system can increase as long as the entropy of the surroundings. I said that wrong, didn't I? The entropy of the system can decrease as long as the entropy of the surroundings increases by a greater amount. So the surroundings are everything in the universe except the system. So if the system decreases in entropy, it can still be spontaneous as long as that entropy gets paid for somewhere else. Does that make sense? So why does freezing water increase the entropy of the surroundings? Because it must. Freezing's exothermic, right? Exothermic meaning energy is leaving the water as it's freezing. Entropy is a dispersal of energy. So as the water freezes, it's releasing energy into the surroundings. That increases the entropy of the surroundings. So we can look at it this way. If entropy increasing is up um, our system, the ice is going down in entropy. The surroundings are going up in entropy. And overall, this is a slight positive change in entropy. So it is spontaneous. Any questions? But the freezing of water is not spontaneous at all temperatures, right? If I put a beaker of water on the counter, would it spontaneously freeze? Below zero, it would but not at all temperatures. So the magnitude of that change in entropy due to the dispersal of energy into the surroundings depends on the temperature. The greater the temperature, the smaller the increase in entropy for a given amount of energy being dispersed, right? Because we said that um, the change in entropy was Q divided by temperature. If T is bigger, 
then that change in entropy is smaller, even if you've got the same amount of heat being exchanged. Energy, entropy measures energy dispersal per unit temperature. So change in energy of the universe, for our system here it was negative for the ice freezing. Um, the change in energy of the surroundings is going to be positive, but it's going to be positive and large at low temperatures, positive and small at high temperatures. And if this positive change is smaller than the negative change, then it's not spontaneous because the energy, of, uh, the entropy of the universe then would still be decreasing. So at low temperature, this change in entropy, negative change in entropy for the ice freezing is the same at high temperature or low temperature. But the change, the positive change in entropy for the surroundings is different. At a lower, I'm sorry, at a higher temperature, the change is less because it's Q divided by T, right? Q is the amount of heat being transferred. That's the same, but the temperature is changing. So this is now still a positive number, but it's smaller. And so when you add these two together, you get a negative. So at a higher temperature, the freezing of ice is not spontaneous. At a lower temperature, it is. Is that idea okay? So system exchanging heat with the surroundings, it changes the entropy of the surroundings because the surroundings then are, are getting this heat and that change in entropy is going to depend on um, the temperature. So we can use um, Q system to quantify delta S surroundings at constant pressure. So we can say that the change in entropy for the surroundings is proportional to the loss in energy of the system. We need this negative sign in here because the Q, is, the energy is going into the surroundings and that's causing a positive change in entropy. So exothermic process, um, we're going to be increasing the entropy of the surroundings because Q is negative for the system when it's exothermic. An endothermic process, we're gonna have a positive Q system and that's gonna, when we stick a positive number in here with this negative sign, that's going to cause the energy or the entropy of the surroundings to decrease, to be negative. Because we're pulling energy out of the system, right? That means we're concentrating it into, pulling energy out of the surroundings, concentrating it into the system. The magnitude of that entropy change is proportional, inversely proportional to the temperature. 1 over T. So we've got that proportionality, and we've got the proportionality that we just looked at, delta S surroundings proportional to negative Q system. We can put these two together and say the change in the entropy of the surroundings is equal to negative Q of the system divided by T. If we have constant pressure and temperature, then delta H is equal to Q. Delta H is equal to Q at constant pressure and temperature. I don't know if you remember from 1A, delta H was uh, Q plus W, and the W is zero when the pressure's constant. Let me go back and it's chapter six. So we end up with this. Change in entropy for the surroundings is equal to negative delta H for the system divided by the temperature. Okay, consider the reaction between nitrogen and oxygen gas to form dinitrogen monoxide. 
Calculate the entropy change in the surroundings associated with this reaction occurring at 25 degrees Celsius. Well, what's the equation we just learned? Delta S for the surroundings is equal to negative delta H for the system divided by the temperature. So we need a negative sign there. And delta H for the system here is 163.2 kilojoules. And this is occurring at 25 degrees Celsius, which is 298 Kelvin. So that's going to be negative 0.548. Kilojoules per Kelvin. Ready, okay with that? What's the sign of the entropy change for the system? We need to look at the balanced chemical equation here and take into account the fact that when you increase the moles of gas, that increases the disorder, that's a positive entropy change. Is, that's what hap is that what's happening here? No, we're going from three moles of gas to two moles of gas, so that's negative. So the entropy change for the system here is going to be negative. So how do we determine the sign of the entropy change for the universe? Well, it's the sum of the system and the surroundings. So the change in entropy for the universe is equal to the change in energy for the system plus the change in energy for the surroundings. Now, we don't know what the entropy change for the system is. But we identify that it was negative. And if we add a negative number to another negative number, what are we going to get? A negative number. If one was positive and one was negative, then we'd need to know which was larger. But they're both negative. So the change in entropy for the universe is negative. Is this, spontane is this reaction spontaneous? No, not at this temperature. Actually, not at any temperature. Question? Yes? Uh, for part A, uh -huh. does the heat, can it stay kilojoules per Kelvin, or does it need to change the temperature? It can stay kilojoules per Kelvin. Yeah. It's just a you know, variation. You can see, though, why joules per Kelvin typically ends up being more useful because a lot of these change in en entropies are actually quite small and so joules per Kelvin works out pretty nicely. We typically express delta H is in kilojoules because that gives us, it's nicer to say 163 rather than 163,000 or 1.63 times 10 to the 5. That's why we have different sized units so we don't have to do that. Here's a question, conceptual connection. We don't have to do a calculation here. Do biological systems contradict the second law of thermodynamics? So by taking energy from their surroundings and synthesizing large complex biological molecules, plants and animals tend to concentrate energy, not disperse it. How can this be so? I can't hear you. Are they expelled? Yeah, they, they give off energy, right? So when a biological system takes in energy, 
and makes these molecules, it's also releasing energy into the surroundings, right? And so that dispersal of energy actually counteracts the decrease in entropy from making more complicated molecules. Nothing can violate the second law of thermodynamics. It's not possible. It's like the law of gravity. Can't just say I'm not going to obey it today. It'd be fun.